So hello there, and welcome to video number two on phylogeny. So if we work in phylogenetics, if we want other people to understand us, that means we have to be able to describe phylogeny. And I'm sorry to say, that means that there's quite a lot of attached baggage in terms of vocabulary to phylogenetics, as you've probably guessed from the fact that we have systematics, cladistics, and phylogenetics in this general area for overlapping but not exactly the same concepts. So with apologies, let's dive right in and let's cover some of the words that we need to be able to uh, use and uh, communicate with when it comes to describing phylogenies. So I'm going to go through some of the key terms on these trees that you can see here. These are all the same trees um, I've just kind of put four on there to allow me a bit more space for my labels. So let's start with a node. So each one of these points that I mentioned in the last video that represents a common ancestor, so in this case, this is the common ancestor for B and E, is called a node in a phylogeny. Between nodes, we have branches. So these, these long things on the way to a node or on the, uh, the way to one of these species on the end here that are labeled A to D, all of those are called branches. The earliest node and the, the branch that um, leads up to it in a phylogeny, so the first evolving one, if these are mapped to time, and we'll get onto that in a second, is called the root. So the root of a phylogeny is kind of at the bottom if time is going upwards in a rooted phylogeny. I'll explain what that means in a minute. With many apologies, we can call the things at the end of our branches, um, which are our kind of units of whatever we're looking at, multiple names. We can call them the tips of the tree. So um, species, in this case, A to E, can be called tips, or they can be called leaves, so like leaves on a tree. Sometimes they're referred to as the taxon or the taxa within the tree, and sometimes they're called terminals. Sometimes they're called the operational taxonomic units, the OTUs. All of those mean exactly the same thing. A to E, in this case, all of those are one of those words. Let's use the word tips, because I quite like the word tips. We've already learned what a clade is, but anything that um, has originates from a node and goes onto a series of um, tips is a, a clade on one of these trees. So this right here is a clade, A to E, Oh, sorry, A to E, A, B, and E are a clade, but so also are A, B, C, and E because they share a common ancestor. So a, a tree shows you a series of nested clades a lot of the time. So that is how we might describe a phylogeny, but there are, there are some tricks out there that can get you, so you need to be a bit careful of these. So actually, think of phylogenies as something a bit like one of these mobiles that's shown on the right-hand side here that can twist around but still show the same thing. So for example, here we have a phylogeny showing the relationships between A, B, C, and D. C and D show a common ancestor. B, C, and D show a common ancestor um, to the exclusion of A and etc. So what you're seeing here is a series of clades. Um, we can actually just twist this around if we want. So we could, for example, take the entire phylogeny and twist it from one way to the other. And then we'd have this tree here, which shows us A, B, C, and D, but with exactly the same relationships with, within these groups. Like on this phylogeny here, C and D in this phylogeny share a common ancestor to the exclusion of B. That means that even though they're drawn differently, they're showing the same relationships. And you could, for example, just um, take this clade here, the B, C, and D clade, and twist that one around. And again, this phylogeny is showing you the same relationships within it. So just be aware that when you're looking at a, um, a phylogeny, the order the, the tips come in doesn't necessarily um, tell you that much about the relationships because you know it's these lines that also define how those things are related to each other. I also wanted to kind of highlight and then quash a common misconception. So as we've learned in the previous video and in evolutionary milestones in this course, life shares a universal common ancestor and everything on the tree of life is um, related to everything else, either very um, kind of uh, recently or very distantly. 
But the important thing to note is that position of tree tips has nothing to do with being advanced. If we take um, everything that's alive today as a, uh, as a living species, say, um, all of those have been evolving for exactly the same amount of time. So whether they're um, highly nested, uh, so they're sitting um, very much in a, in a position with lots and lots of branches on the way to them, or if they're sitting on a very, very long branch to the present, that doesn't mean anything really about one being more advanced from the other. Everything has evolved for exactly the same length of time since this last universal common ancestor. Another thing to highlight is that typically we often, in, in kind of situations where we're thinking about fossils, for example, we think of phylogeny as being rooted. So I highlighted the word root here. And if we have a rooted phylogeny, this means that this is the earliest cladogenic event, then that one and that one, and that one. This is the root, and time is going upwards. That is a rooted phylogeny. So with a root, you know in which direction time is traveling on your phylogeny. But you don't need, necessarily, to have a rooted phylogeny. You can have an unrooted phylogeny, such as that that's shown on the left here. This doesn't really tell us which direction time is going. All it tells us is about the interrelationships between these different groups of organisms. So this still shows us that B and E are most closely related to each other and that they share a common ancestor and that A, B and E also form a clade um, to the exclusion of C and D. But we could place the root at any point on this tree. Um, it could be that the earliest branching point was say here between B and E and that would lead to a different picture of evolutionary relationships to the one that we're seeing here in terms of their time, in terms of the timing in which this happened. So um, an unrooted phylogeny tells us about the, the relationships, and of course it tells us that evolution is happening along these branches, but it doesn't tell us about the, the order or the real time in which these events are happening. I hope that makes sense, but if not, um, do ask me in person. There are also uh, lots of ways that we can describe um, groups of organisms within a phylogeny. So I'm going to whiz through these now. And the first of these is monophyletic, or so monophyly is, the, is a condition, and monophyletic is a description, an adjective about a group. But a monophyletic group of species shares a single common ancestor. Um, so you can see a definition here, applied to a group of organisms originating from a single ancestor. That also includes all of the descendants of that common ancestor. So on a phylogenetic tree, a monophyletic group includes a node and all of the descendants of that node um, that's represented by both nodes and terminal taxa. So for example here, this is a monophyletic group, that's a clade, that's a, a clade by definition is a monophyletic, G and H form a monophyletic group. So do E, F, G and H, they descend from this node here. So do D, E, F, G and H, that's a, a, a monophyletic group. So in fact is the entire tree, they share a common ancestor. And you can see a couple more monophyletic groups or clades here. Okay, so a monophyletic group is described as such. That we can contrast with a paraphyletic group. So a paraphyletic group is said of a taxon that includes some but not all descendants of the common ancestor. So that includes some of the descendants of one of our nodes but excludes some of the taxa within a clade. Um, so this is not a clade, it is a paraphyletic group. And you can see examples in these blue boxes here. So this is a, um, a group A and B that then excludes C. So this doesn't form a monophyletic group. It would only do so if it included C, um, and therefore it doesn't form a clade. Similarly, um, here you can see G and H uh, can be considered a paraphyletic group, but they're not monophyletic because they, if we are any group G and H, we're excluding E and F. You may be wondering why I'm telling you this. I mean, why would we even care what a paraphyletic group is? But actually, some really quite um, familiar concepts that we tend to use in everyday speech still are paraphyletic groups. So uh, reptilia, as it's classically considered within the taxonomic system, though there were some moves to try and, um, in linear taxonomy, to get rid of reptilia, um, because it isn't monophyletic. This is a paraphyletic group because it has lizards, crocodiles, and then a bunch of what we consider dinosaurs all the way up to wherever you define the origin of birds. Let's say Archaeopteryx for simplicity's sake, though it's probably 
not by most people's standards nowadays. Everything that's descended from Archaeopteryx upwards, we would call a bird. So birds are a subgroup of the reptiles that in the idea of reptilia are traditionally excluded. If we wanted to think about this in terms of clades, we would have a reptile bird clade, okay? And then we don't have any, any problems. So, so reptiles are a paraphyletic group. Another way we can describe a group of organisms on a phylogeny is polyphyletic, or I'm representing polyphyly. So this is the occurrence in taxa of members that have descended via different ancestral lineages. Um, so this is a group that really isn't defined by a common ancestor. Obviously, all of the tree of life, everything has ultimately a common ancestor. But if we look at this example that labeled here, A, B, E, and H, there is no way we can describe this grouping apart from going back to the last universal common ancestor that they share, which may be a very, very long time ago. And there are a series of groups in the, um, in the, the kind of natural world where, uh, as a shorthand, we do tend to, to use a name to refer to a polyphyletic assemblage. So for example, um, slugs are just snails that have lost their shell, but they actually look, belong to different, multiple different lineages that share a common ancestor very, very deep within the gastropods. And so that doesn't really, um, isn't a very useful group within a phylogenetic context. And as this definition shows us, um, modern phyletic taxonomists, that's basically people that do phylogenies, um, consider any group that is polyphyletic unnatural and so we'll try and fix that situation but obviously sometimes a slug is a useful shorthand. Algae are another example of a polyphyletic group of organisms. Systemicists, people that look especially at phylogenetics, also consider something when they're talking about fossils that we term crown groups and stem groups. These allow us to differentiate um, different types of relationships between extinct and extant taxa. So the crown group is a clade that is defined by extant species. So here on this diagram all of these crosses mean that a group has gone extinct. And a crown group consists of the most recent shared common ancestor of all extant members of a clade as well as all descendants of that common ancestor whether they are living or extinct. So for example in this crown group here, crown group B, you can see that we've got this living taxon, that one, that one and that one, and also a couple of extinct groups. But nevertheless, they share this common ancestor, therefore we call them the crown group. In contrast to that, we can term something uh, a stem group if it consists of a paraphyletic grouping of extinct species that are positioned um, just below uh, a crown group in terms of the, um, the relationships of a lineage, so they're on its stem. So a stem group is more closely related to its corresponding crown group than to other extant um, sister clade of any given crown group. So in this case, we've got a stem group here. So all of these um, organisms, stem group and crown group B, share a common ancestor here. All of these are extinct, but they're most closely related to crown group B than they are to crown group A. Therefore, we call this the stem group of clade B. So uh, dinosaurs, for example, are the stem group to birds, the crown group. And so this is a useful way of thinking about living and extinct, extinct taxa. And we can do exactly the same with crown group A and stem group A. So have a look at that and make sure you're happy with what that is telling us. Stem groups are by definition always paraphyletic with respect to their crown group. So that is a thing that is true. Another good example of a stem group is um, found in the evolution of our own species. So there are many um, species of ancient human. They may be members of the genus Homo, or they may be human-like species that are known from our fossil record that share much more in common with modern Homo sapiens than they do with, say, the chimpanzees. They include Lucy that we met in Evolution 201, Australopithecus afarensis, as well as famous species such as Homo erectus and Homo neanderthalis. These we refer to as hominins. We are the sole living hominin. All other members of this group are extinct, and they may therefore be considered stem group hominins. 
they're more closely related to us than they are to our closest living relative, the chimpanzee, but they are all extinct. So they are they have um, evolved on the way or as part of the human lineage and now extinct. We are the remaining crown group and all of these species are the human stem group. So that's a, an example of a stem group right there in action. And that brings me to the end of this video. Uh, so I will see you shortly in video number three. So I'll see you there in a second.